Making America Great Again. That's a good phrase, isn't it? Now, Donald Trump is a good man for America. He's a man who wants to put America first, wants to put his own people first. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Well, every country, every nation, every people has similar patriots who want to put their own country first. And our next speaker is going to speak about making Iran great again. Please welcome Shahin Najad. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, I left Iran in 97, and after staying in, in the West, uh, it took me about two years to find out that the freedom of expression is pretty limited, even in the free world. But today was, an, was a different experience for me. Uh, a group of people have sat here uh, to have a civilized uh, discussions about different topics which are related to their own society and another group of people came to the door and uh, caused a very unfriendly environment uh, to scare you off and I see this as a shortfall, as a failure of the real owners of this country, who are you? You should have. You should have taken real action, serious actions, 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier. Uh, we wouldn't have had the circumstance today. The good news is it's still, it's not too late. And uh, having people here for this particular occasion shows that there is a significant awareness among uh, the real owners of the country. Uh, you shouldn't give up easily. And I guess what Americans did in US, based on the recent uh, political uh, events, they showed, at least half of them showed, that they are going to get their country back. Right. I hope I see it in the future. And I've got a very clear and obvious sign to figure out a nation has awakened or not. If freely, without any uh, hesitation, you introduce yourself as a nationalist, I think now you've, you, have, uh, you are brave enough to uh, claim that you can uh, get your country back. If you hesitate to use that word, means it's still a long way to go. <clears throat> After the Second World War, um, the world changed in many respects, including a major change in how nationalism is viewed. The winners of the war decided to brand nationalism as the guilty party responsible for the catastrophic war. According to them, it was the end of nationalism era. The situation for patriots became worse after the rise of the left wing in Europe, especially in France of the late 60s. However, due to the intensive friction between the West from one side and Soviet Union and its satellites from another, another side, a very diluted kind of nationalism was tolerated as patriotism uh, just so as to be prepared in the event that a new war takes place between the two new powers. By the time of the collapse of the communist world in the early 90s, the need for tolerating even that little patriotism was removed and the globalist agenda 
of the new world order became the enemy of the nationalism more straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. What was that new world order? The new <coughs> world order of that time <coughs> can be summarized uh, in what David Rockefeller <coughs> described in his speech in the Bilderberg meeting in Baden, Germany in June 1991. I quote, we are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have <coughs> attended our meetings and respected their promises of this creation for almost 40 years. Means it started almost at the end of the war. And then he continued, quote, it would have been impossible for us to develop or plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. <coughs> the supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national autodetermination practiced in past centuries. <coughs> I guess the message was very clear. Since that time, mass media, Hollywood, the music industry, and unfortunately a major portion of the educational institutes, universities, have been in the service of that agenda. And I don't think I need to mention their great achievements up to now. They have done a great job to uh, get, uh, to catch their goals. Not in Israel, they haven't. <laughs> These forces with their previously mentioned goals are called globalist, at least in my vocabulary. Money buys power. By influencing public opinion, they paved the roads for politicians to get elected. In return, politicians carry out their plans and follow their agenda. It's a win-win case for them. The real losers <coughs> have been the majority of people. In the past two decades, globalists have been accompanied by another strong stream, fundamentalist Islam. Also, the ideology of Islamists is very different from the ultra-liberalist -liberal views of the globalists. They found a common cause, eliminating the national identity of the Westerner countries and dissolving the European cultures into a so-called melting pot, which causes weakening of the existing nation states, especially in Europe. Globalists intend to abolish the European nation states in order to achieve the bankers and billionaires full hegemony over humankind. That was very explicit, described by David Rockefeller, one of the founder of this new world order. And on the other hand, Islamists are going to weaken the national identities of the Western countries to establish the Islamic Khalifa under Allah watch. Therefore, they have a common road to make their journey together regardless of their opposite social beliefs. The regular migration of non-Europeans, especially Muslims, to the West was not massive enough to eliminate the cultural identity of the host countries in the short term. It would require several decades or even century. Therefore, an urgent and significant plan was put together. What was the plan? The plan was flooding Europe by millions of non-European immigrants, especially Muslims, as asylum seekers.
Here was the solution of the globalists, overthrowing the secular dictators of the Middle East, Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi, Bashar Assad, uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak, and so on, causing a power vacuum in those countries and igniting sectarian wars in the region. Then people don't have to move to Europe just for seeking better life or enjoying human rights. They rush to the West for saving their lives and finding, and finding a shelter for themselves and their families. This solution was applied to Iraq, to Libya, to Syria, to Afghanistan, to Yemen, and in some extent uh, to uh, north of Africa, which the story is different a little bit. The globalists tried this method in Egypt, but they failed after coup d'etat by General al-Sisi. So their program failed in Egypt. In Afghanistan, after getting rid of Taliban, there was not a solid determination to bring back the law and order to the country. These countries have been more like failed states, or in some cases, even stateless nations. In the Middle East, the, ma the major military actions which were carried out by NATO, by NATO members in the past two decades, have been in the direction of generating more refugees and immigrants and pushing them into Western countries rather than returning stability and security to those nations. With this trend of mass migration and the additional support of special elements in the rich Arab countries, the face of major European cities has changed dramatically in the past few decades. Today, it's not easy to find an Englishman in London or a Frenchman in Paris. <clears throat> Let's look at some statistics. The overall number of mosques in the United States increased from 1,200 in 2000 to 2,100 in 2010, an increase of 75% over nine years. Within the same period of time, number of mosques and Muslim prayers rooms in France increased from 1,000 to 2,400, 240% within nine years increase. <coughs> there were an uh, estimated 1,800 mosques in UK in 2010, so it's seven years old, this data. 1,800 mosques in UK seven years ago. The total, of, uh, the total number of Muslims in the European Union in 2010, or European Union means perhaps excluding Turkey, was 20 million. I'm pretty sure after the recent events, it has become probably 24, 25 million. With this grim situation in view, how is Iranian Renaissance potentially an ally of the European nationalists? The Iranian Renaissance movement has been working on causing a cultural revolution in Iranian society. The basis for this would be the original Iranian culture values and worldviews prior to the Arab invasion and Islamization of the Iranian plateau. In fact, the European Renaissance revitalized the intellectual and artistic culture of ancient Greece and Rome to bring about the reverse of a constructive non-religious society Likewise, in the Iranian Renaissance, we are looking to the past to learn from to learn from it in order to affect the reverse of our nation and inaugurate a shining new era in its glorious history. The main difference <laughs> the main difference has been the material of this Renaissance. Ancient Greek and Roman worldviews and heritage for the European Renaissance, but the ancient Persian worldviews and heritage for the Iranian Renaissance. They were not the same, although because of having the same roots 
in the Indo-European culture, there were a lot of similarities between these two. Ideals such as moral rationalism, kherat garai, justice and order, dot, economic and social development, abad sazi, and tolerance, ravadari, are the backbone of the Iranian worldview, which are the heritage of a wider Indo-European civilization and ideology. I'm talking about an Indo-European worldview that has flourished in the Persian, Greek, and Roman worlds. The same ethos made Iran, Rome, and Byzantium prosperous and well-developed in the period of late antiquity before the medieval age. <clears throat> Just to confirm my claim about this brotherhood or similarity, let's look at few historical reports which have come to us from uh, Roman historians. Uh, the first one is from Malalas, I guess living in the seventh century. <clears throat> in the world of Kabat, the Iranian king, lived in 6th century, the Iranian king, what it says, it says uh, both Iran Shah, means Persian Empire, and the Roman Empire are by divine plan the two centers of civilization, the moon of the west and the sun of the east. This is the way they called each other, the sun of the east means Iran, or Iranian king, the moon of the west, the Roman emperor. The second one is from uh, an Iranian ambassador uh, quote, uh, when he addressed these things in front of Galerius, uh, the Roman emperor. He says, the two guardians of order and progress in the world Look at the values, order and progress. These were those backbones of the wider Indo-European culture and worldview that I was talking about. They knew 15 centuries ago, 14 centuries ago, about this common uh, values and common characters between this civilization. The two guardians of order and progress in the world, which, like a man's two shining eyes, ought to adorn and illustrate each other and not in the extremity of their fury to seek rather each other's destruction. Regardless of the competition, regardless of sometimes even military contacts and battles, the plan was not destroying the other one. Every side recognized the other side to, to be a counterpart which has to exist in order to keep the order of the world and making progress toward a better world. And the third one is from Malalas again. It says, uh, the king of Persia and Roman emperor called each other brother and their queens called each other sister even during periods of war. That's very interesting. You don't see that mentality among those who come to this country or other uh, developed countries. They come to destroy what you have built in the past several centuries. That's totally different with the mentality of two competitors back in 5th century or 4th century or even before that. Let's focus on Iran for a minute. In the Iranian society over the past 14 centuries, two identities have been competing and sometimes even fighting with each other. The Iranian identity and the Islamic identity. The Islamic ident identity in the past five centuries has changed to Shia identity because Shia became majority in Iran almost from early 16th century. <clears throat> In different occasions, one of these two pushed the other one to the corner for a while, but both of them survived up to the current time, up to the present time. 
the theocratic Islamic regime's behavior within the past four decades has opened people's eyes, especially among the Iranian youth. The failure of the current regime in almost all respects and as measured by almost all indices of a country, social, economic, and political, has acted to significantly weaken the Islamic identity and has pushed the nation toward its non-Islamic heritage and ideology. Our goal in Iranian Renaissance is to reinforce and promote the Aryan identity and cultural and culture against the Islamic mindset and worldview. That's the only winner card that we have in our hand, and it seems it's working. At least in the past four or five years, we have seen it's working very efficiently. Iranian Renaissance can be a good role model for several Middle Eastern and North African nations. How? Promoting the indigenous identity and heritage against the Islamic tradition and ideology. Also because of its historical background and ethnic characteristics, Iran has the best requirements to be a pioneer in this renaissance. Other countries in the region have some foundation to build their cases on. Egypt, with its long mysterious history before Islam, Lebanon and Syria with their Phoenician background, Tunisia with its Cartesian heritage, and so on. In all of these cases, indigenous heritage and identity can be reinforced in society to compete with Islamic identity and isolate it. Now, I'm trying to get to the conclusion of my talk First, the nationalists have to work together as a network in order to make a strong resistance against the united front of the globalists and Islamists. <laughs> they are too strong to be defeated by one force or one nation. We have to act together. Second. The mass migration of non-Europeans, especially Muslims, to Europe has been planned and executed by the globalists in order to destroy the national resistance of the European nations yeah. and eventually dissolve the nation-states into a war that will be ruled by non-formal regime of bankers and billionaires. I don't think I need to mention some of these names, you know better. Than <laughs> and the third, one of the effective actions that can prevent or significantly reduce this change of cultural identity of the Western <coughs> countries is assisting the nationalist secular forces of the Middle Eastern countries. They are the only force that can defeat the fundamentalists in some of the Islamic countries. Going by military, bombing them, trying to, I don't know, uh, impose some uh, sanctions, it doesn't work. You have to reinforce the non-religious nationalist forces, as you have seen in the past, when these, even, even dictators, but secular dictators were in charge, the situation for the Europe was not like today. <laughs> so we've got two victims. Those poor people in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Afghanistan, who have been bombed, lost their lives, lost their houses, their families, everything, and had to move. And the second victims of owners of these countries in Europe who are going to lose their country because they don't take any action. Two victims to me. And the fourth and the last conclusion, <coughs> the Iranian Renaissance is an, is, a, is an extensive and deep cultural campaign for rebirthing the pre-Islamic Iran, Persia. A new Iran which will 
which will have common values and worldview with the rest will have its unique character and be surely able to contribute into the world into the world prosperity and development i hope so. Nationalism, enlightened nationalism, it is the only thing that makes any sense. International nationalism is the only internationalism that makes any sense. So I say let every nation, every people make itself great again. And by so doing, smash globalism and let's make the world great again. Shaheen